Jesus and they're playing. Have you, are, you, are you lost in the moment right now? Like, are you are you taking advantage of this moment? They're singing and leading us right now and saying, Jesus, we adore you, we love you. But if you saw today, in the early morning hours, if you saw today, why is it that you love Jesus? Or have you even thought, do I love Jesus? Because here's something I can tell you. He sure does love you. God, He sure does love you. And some of you this morning have come to a place, you've come to a, a church because somebody's invited you or, or because maybe you just felt like you're supposed to go this Sunday morning, but you really don't know about how the big guy upstairs feels about you. So you're still dragging around from 1987 with you, right? Still carrying some stuff with you that you think he's mad at you about, but he's not mad at you. The truth is, about you. So desperate to have a friendship, a family, a relationship with you. And as they're singing this song, I can only imagine what the Father's doing. What, what he's thinking. We look down at people. And the people in this room who really get it that Jesus loves me. The people in this room, see, God knows your heart right now. God knows if y'all are thinking about XFL or if you're thinking about the flea market or if you're thinking about uh, chips and salsa after it's over with. Or He knows if you're thinking about God, that mess I made this week, man, I messed that up. But I sure do thank you for loving me anyway. God, the things you brought me out of. God, where I was. God, who I was. I'm not that person anymore. God, I just thank you for who I am. His heart is in tune with your heart. This morning. Can y'all just, just, just sing that one more time? I'm going to shut up. Y'all just start singing. And the people of God. Worship the God who loves you. Let's sing together. Enough. 
more than enough. Who can use a little more than enough in your life? Like, like right now, just enough would be great. I don't have enough. I'd, I'd like to have enough, but the thought of having more than enough. Well, you know who owns all of the more than enough and not only can put it into your life, but, but wants to put it in your life? God has more than enough, and He's waiting on His people to catch up with His vision for this world and for His people so that He can release His blessings, release what He wants to do. Because how many of y'all know, man, we live in a time, we live in a city, we live in a community, we live in a, in a region where there are a lot of people who are hurting. Did y'all know that? Just because it may not be terrible at your house right now, start looking around, man. There are people who are desperate for help, desperate for hope, and looking for answers. And the place they find that should be right here in the church where God's people come together. And so this morning, as we talk about more than enough, uh, we're going to get to the Scriptures in just a minute, but, but I spent a little time... I <clears throat> spent a little time this week just reflecting back on how God has, has shown up more than enough in my life, uh, truly in the life of this church. And so I was thinking back this morning about where did all this start, man? Where was this like this church? Where did all this start? And I thought, you know what? I don't share the story enough with this group. A lot of y'all have been coming for a year, a couple years, whatever. You really have no idea where this church came from. Uh, what? How did we get here? And so, if I back way up, if I back way up, I can take you back to like like 2005 when I when I was working in in the textile industry, and God just undeniably called me into full time ministry, and He put me at Osborne Baptist Church in Eden, North Carolina, where I became a youth pastor for a while, and then after that, I was a discipleship director for about. Four years, worked with for a while, worked with teenagers, and then I worked with small groups and Sunday school and a whole lot of other things. But in that period, God began convincing me that, that when I looked at that church, the church that I was a part of, and it was a large church, man, and when people came into that church, people were happy. They were excited to go to the church, and they would you, you would just see people mingling together. They couldn't wait to get to church, whether it was during the week or on Sunday, and they came in, and the music was powerful, and the message was powerful, and the ministry of the church was powerful. And God began showing me this thing that, we need more of that in our culture. See what's going on here. And let's figure out how to take it, do that somewhere else. And so along about 2012, 2012, <coughs> God began to open doors for us to, to start a brand new church in Danville, Virginia. And I looked at a lot of different places, but, but the church that I was attending had a group of people who were, were from the Danville area. They were already driving to Eden. And so uh, in the summer of 2012, we had a little interest meeting and said, hey, anybody interested in helping us to start a new church over in Danville? And if I remember right, we had probably 70 people or so that showed up at that interest meeting and said, I want to be part of that. And so a little bit later on that year, October, we started getting organized. Or what we thought was organized, we didn't, we didn't have a clue. We were a hot mess, y'all. I mean, we were trying to figure this thing out. But we started meeting every week, getting ready to start a church. January of 2013 rolls around. Y'all didn't even know this company existed. But we get online and we look up this company called Church on Wheels. Come on, somebody. Church on wheels. That's my people right there. Uh, we get with Church on Wheels, and we find out that we can purchase a trailer. And in this trailer, they'll put these rolling bins inside of it. And in these rolling bins, they will have everything for kids and nursery and for the lobby and for lights and sound and stage. Some of the stuff that you see in here, these, these speakers that are right here were the first speakers that we had that we bought when we were, when we were starting things up. What were we doing? Well, we didn't have a building. We didn't have a place to go, so we got with the local movie theater, down the stadium cinemas, down there beside Chick-fil-A and all that, and we worked out a deal where we could come in there and have one of the cinemas from 10 o'clock until, uh, I think, 1 o'clock when we had to be done. They started showing movies around 1. So we had one, one theater that was where we had our main service, that big lobby that you go into in the movie theater. Man, we trans that thing, transformed it, had all this bridge town. That was the name of our church then. We had all that stuff in there. And we had another theater across the aisle. That's where our kids was. 
I did not know that Kim Galden was going to be here. She's sitting on the front row. Kim just popped in today, and she was our very first kids director, and she set that thing up every week. Kim, man, Kim was so awesome. She would she would bring in goats and chickens and rabbits for those kids to play with. I don't know why they need goats and chickens and rabbits, but they needed them, and they had them. And so that's where we started. And so on, on January the 20th, 2013, as Daniel Stadium said, was Bridgetown Church was launched, was birthed. We had our first public meeting. Y'all, we had 257 people show up in one service to that, that movie theater, and it was incredible. It was beyond anything I'd imagined. Like, like I, I, and what I'm telling you is a very, this has been years of my life planning, dreaming, praying. I remember walking around my neighborhood one night saying, God, January 20th is when we're launching, 120. God, could you bring 120 people on our first night? God, first day, God brought 257 people to the first service. Man, talk about more than enough, doubled my vision for things. And that's been a pretty constant thing, man. And when I look at that, though, 257 people, y'all know how this stuff is. The new wear is off of stuff. And as the year went on, by the end of that year, we got to the end of 2013, and we were averaging about 140 people at that point. And we were, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. We knew that we couldn't keep going in the movie theater. We've got to find a place to go. And we prayed, 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 looked and looked and looked. And God provided this facility that we're in right now. And on August 31st of 2014, a year and a half later, we move into this place and we begin doing church, Bridgetown Church, right here on Deer Run Road. Now, enough about all that. What I can tell you from there is from... From then until now, we were 140 people on a weekend. Now this church on a weekend averages right around 500 people every weekend. And, and that's just where we are now because I can show you the map. And if you look at this point, we're here and then here and then here and then here. And God is continuing to grow. And I can, I can take you, there are people in this room that were part of Bridgetown uh, that were baptized at the old YMCA pool. That we, we baptized people there. We baptized people here. We tried to baptize people in the river one time. And, and, and God shut that thing down because he knew we were going to love somebody. The water was too low and we couldn't do it that day. So it's shut it down. Probably a bad idea in the first place. But man, we have seen so many. We, we probably average 40 to 50 people that are baptized uh, every year. And that number is growing. And, and on and on and on. And God is just doing amazing things. And so now we're in a place where here at this facility, y'all heard me say this lots of times, look around, man. If the person beside you didn't put no deodorant on this morning, you got a problem. So, so there ain't no space between you and the person, right? And it's tight in here. All of our spaces are tight. Go back into the kids' area. It's tight. Student ministry is tight. The lobby is tight. And so God has provided a place for us, 215 3rd Avenue in Danville, Virginia. <laughs> And so we're in the process of working over there. We've got people that are showing up. We have people over there Monday night, Tuesday night. There's a team over there Saturday. I don't know when else. Other times during the week, people are working over there. But I want to just say this to you tonight, or this morning. I want to say this to you right off the bat. Our, our purpose and our mission is not to build big buildings. It is not to have fancy places. Our mission is exactly what Jesus said. God has a plan. And Jesus said the plan is, look, okay, it's great. I need you to get together. Let's worship together. Let's, let's praise Him. Let's talk about Jesus. We love you. Let's do all of that. And then when your heart gets filled up, He says, go. Yes. Make yes. disciples. Yes. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all these things I've commanded you. And surely, listen, listen, listen. <clears throat> surely, I'm with you always. Even on the days when you don't know how you're going to pay for the vision. I'm with you even on the days, Jeff, when you lay in the bed thinking, what in the world did we sign our name to? Even on the days when you think, how is all this work going to get done? Jesus says, surely, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so that's our plan, man, and that's where we're going. And I believe, I believe, I believe, and I declare that God has huge plans for Compassion Church right here in Danville, Virginia. 
You know, I look around, uh, you probably do the same thing. We're, we're, we're people of a, of a certain age, and in this age that we live in now, we have access to the Internet, and we can see. You don't have to go to church services. You can watch church services online. You can read books. You can go to conferences. You can YouTube, all this stuff. And I'm a student of all of those things. I love to see what God's doing in other places. And it thrills my heart when I look at some of the churches that I follow week after week. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, North Point Church in Alpharetta, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, where Andy Stanley is the pastor, has become a network of churches. And every year, one time a year, they take up one offering, they take up an offering, and they set it up, and they tell people, we're going to take up this offering, and every dollar that comes in, we're going to use to partner with other organizations that already exist, and, and we're not going to use one dollar of this for ourselves. We're going to take this money, and we're going to, to bless our community. We're going to come alongside of other projects. Y'all, they take up literally millions of dollars every year, and they give it away. That's one church. Another church, Church of the Highlands in, in Birmingham, Alabama. I've been to North Point. I've been to Church of the Highlands. Church of the Highlands, I, I watch them just about every week. And I can tell you all kinds of stories about what they're doing with, with God's resources and how God's growing them and how they were just a small church in a school building just a few years ago. And now 70,000 people every weekend are attending their church. But that's not what's so amazing to me. What's so amazing to me is they have favor in Alabama. They have connections. With the, with the Alabama Department of Corrections and their services are streamed into the prison facility. Every Department of uh, Corrections facility in Alabama, they're there. And they do the same thing. They take up money. They give away money. They're blessing people everywhere. Go west to Los Angeles, L.A. Dream Center. What a cool name. I wish our church was named L.A. Dream Center. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Uh, uh, L.A. Dream Center, man. Dream Center, I was looking on their website, and they've got things where, where they're involved in, in things like human trafficking, and they're involved with homelessness, and they're involved with, with, with helping with the poverty situation, and on and on and on. And you guys know about all of these things, but what you may not know, and these are just three churches, there are a million of them. When I look at them, you know what they are? They're young. And when I say they're young, these churches were just a dream, a vision, a plan, an idea that someone had about 20 years ago. About 20 years ago. If God can do that in 20 years in this country, in this time, with a group of people who had their eyes on Him, not on buildings, not on fortune, not on fame, what does that say to us? God says that when my people get focused on my vision, the results are immeasurable. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at Ephesians 3.20 where he, said, where he said infinitely more. God wants to do infinitely more through you, through us, than anything that we have ever imagined. And so this morning, I want to just quickly take you to a little passage of Scripture that I love. It's fascinating to me. And it's found in the book of Exodus. And it's a story where, <clears throat> if, you know the, if you know the story of the Exodus, you know that God's people, the Israelite people, were in bondage in Egypt to Pharaoh. God shows up, does immeasurably more. He does more than enough. And He sets the people free from the rulership of the Pharaoh. And now they move from there and they're going to the promised land. Let me say that again. They were in a place where they were in bondage and they were in captivity. But it sure was comfortable. This is what we know. I mean, it may not be the best thing in the world, but this is what we know. God has a plan to take them to a promised land that is more than they can ever imagine. And yeah, that sounds like a good thing, but it sure is comfortable over here because we know how to be captives. We know how to be slaves. We know how to be prisoners. And outside of everything else I'm talking about this morning, some of you need to hear this morning that God's saying to you in your very personal life, have you become so comfortable in your servitude in your slave ship, in your, in your mess where, where everything has got a hold of you, that you're, you're too afraid to even move forward and go to what God has in front. God has a promised land for you individually. But it's going to take you making some steps to get there. And so it was with the people of Israel. God's going to move them forward. And He's going to tell them that as I move you forward, you're going to, you're going to go in, and they're going to go from being people who were Israelites, Hebrews, in Egypt. Now they're going to become this nomadic people that's wandering, traveling. That's not the plan. They became that because of their disobedience. 
Let me say this again. They wandered for 40 years and missed out on the promises of God because of their disobedience. They had to wander for 40 years. God said, we're going to go from, from, from here where you are to the promised land. It was 40 days journey to get there, and it took them 40 years. Do you want that to be the case in your life? I, look, I don't want that to be the case in the life of this church. I want to live and see this thing grow and thrive and become all that it can be. But for that to happen, we collectively have to be obedient. And so go with me now into Exodus 25. God's going to give them some direction. Here's the first thing that I want you to know as you begin to, to take notes in your outline. God's plans are carried out by people with hearts to give. With hearts to give. Now, now listen, if you're, if you're that person who comes to church and says, oh shoot, here you go, here you go, the preacher talking about giving again. I'm going to talk about give because our God gave. God loved and God gave. God saw a need and He gave to it and He called His people to do the same thing. And when people have the hearts to give, guess what happens? God's plan to move us forward, to move us up, to help meet needs, God's plan to carry it out. Exodus 25, starting at verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. In other words, God's saying, bring an offering. Where is it going to come from, God? Don't you worry about that. I will put the prompting into their heart, and it's going to come from every person whose heart is prompted to give. Verse 3. Now he goes into this list here. This doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but in verse 3 he says, these are the offerings you're to receive from them. Remember, this was not a cash society. This was a society where, where they moved in, in goods and services. Tell them to bring gold and silver and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin. Look, if y'all bring some goat hair in here today, that ain't going to work. All right, I'm just gonna say, that ain't going to work. <laughs> the ram skin is dyed red and hides of sea cows. I have no idea what that is, but anyway. Acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastbeat. All of that makes sense if you read the context of all of this because all of these are things that are going to be needed. These are items that will be needed to build this sanctuary uh, that he's telling them to bring. Now, verse 8. He says, then, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. What is God saying? Well, he's saying that this, this sanctuary, this tabernacle, is going to be a place where the people of God are going to encounter the presence of God. But for you to, to have a place where you can experience the, the presence of God, the people of God are going to have to make an investment. And you say, he's asking them to bring gold and silver and all of these expensive things. Well, can I just tell you, the people that I sit across the table from on a daily basis, and the people that pour out their hearts to me, people who don't know if they're going to live until tomorrow, people who, if I do live tomorrow, it's going to suck worse than yesterday did, the people who are saying, I would give anything for hope. If you're one of those people, and God says, if you'll bring gold, silver, God, I don't care. You can have everything I have if you'll just heal this thing that's going on in my heart. God prompts the hearts of people, and the people give. And here's what I know. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of us in this room right here, we are people who have been in that place where our hearts were the ones that were broken. We made our way into the presence of God. He saved us and we were baptized and we came out of that. And a lot of you right here now, your life is different because of what God's done. And what He's saying to you is are you going to be satisfied with that or are you going to move it forward so that other people can have that same experience? Wow. What's He saying, man? Well, in those days, the sanctuary was a place where where the sacrifices were made, where the presence of God dwelled and He gave Moses instructions on where to go. What does it mean for us? Well, we're working on, on rebuilding, restoring, repairing a building over there. And the beautiful thing today is the presence of God today, it doesn't, it doesn't just dwell in, in buildings, it dwells inside of men and women. Right? So when we accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in us. But man, when we come together, when we have a place where we can worship, we get filled up and we go out from there. And that's the work that we're doing. Um, so, 
What's next? Well, God's plans next. God's plans are carried out by the people who are willing to do the work. God's plans are carried out by people who are willing to do the work. Fascinating to me that, that in the Scriptures you see these people. We, we know Peter and James and Paul and Moses and all of these things. But if you're a person, if you're a, a lady who likes, to, who likes to arrange things and work things and make things pretty and do those kinds of things, if you're a guy who likes to build and work, can I tell you that the, the craft, the skill, the ability that God has given you is no less important than, he, than what He's given to preachers and prophets and musicians. It is so important. Look at what He says. And we're going to chapter 36 now, starting in verse 1. He says, so Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the... Did y'all see how I went past that name real quick? Uh, I figured I said it real quick. Y'all didn't know if I said it wrong. Um, anyway. <laughs> every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of the construction of the sanctuary or to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Bezalel, Aholiab, these men were skilled workers and they knew how to do things. And in the same way, what I'm finding is we spend time over at 3rd Avenue is every time we say, hey guys, we're going to have a work day. We're going to have some people working tonight. Different people are showing up. And we're seeing some of you guys have amazing skills. We're seeing how you know how to build and you know how to fix things. And man, I sit back and Jackie laughs at me because I'm like, man, how are we going to do this, baby? How are we going to get all this work done? And every time I start worrying about things, God sends a, a Tim Wilkinson or God sends a, a, a whoever. A Joe, I don't know where Joe is, man. Mo, lots of different people. I've made so many new friends just by being over there. And look, I'm a preacher, man. I will pray for y'all. Say, y'all get at me. It's all good. Right on. Right on. But y'all are getting it done. It takes all of that to make it happen. But it's not just about money. It's not just about time. It's about having a heart generous. So what's the next thing? Well, the next thing is when God's people are generous, God's work gets done. When God's people are generous, God's work gets done. Time, money. Look at verses 2 and 3. Then Moses summoned Bethlehem and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. Notice that if you've got the ability to fix things, to make things, to create things, to make things that look ugly, turn them into pretty, God gave you that ability. Let's not just go running past that. God gave you that ability. Why did He give you that ability? Part of it, yes, so that you can make a living and take care of your family. But He gave you that ability just like He gave these singers and musicians the ability to do what they do to glorify Him. You builders, you creators, you fixer-uppers. God gave you that ability to use it for His glory. When you do, He blesses you. Every person whom the Lord has given ability and who is willing to come and do the work, they receive from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So the men were doing the work. The people were bringing the resources to Moses. Moses was accumulating all this stuff. He was saying, okay, you need gold to do this. Here's your gold. Here's your silver. Here's your yarn. Here's your oil. They're bringing the stuff. Moses is turning around. They're able to do everything they need to do. Man, it wasn't cheap to do that, but, but God gave Moses specific details. And some of the details on this sanctuary, this tabernacle, overlay this with gold, make this rest feast for the priest, very specific, inlay it with, with gems of onyx and jasper and carnelian, all of this stuff. They had to have all of that stuff. Where did it come from? It came from the people. God gave it to the people. God said, there's a vision, there's a need. I'm going to use you. This is where I'm going to connect with you. Just do what I say. I gave you this. Listen, if you're struggling to let go of what God's given you, did He not give it to you the first time? And can He not give it to you ten more times? Ten times bigger than what He gave it to you the first time? He's waiting to see what you're going to do with what all He's already given you. Well, Accomplishing God's plan meant that the people had to give their time. Accomplishing God's plan meant that the people had to give their money. What happens? When God's people give, God provides. When God's people give, give, God provides. So look what happens when all the people begin bringing the resources into the project and giving generously. Verses 4 and 5. This is hilarious to me. This is fascinating. 
It says, so, because they were bringing it to Moses, Moses was giving it to the other people, were bringing it morning after morning after morning, day after day. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work. Now, I don't know if you ever worked in a factory like I did, but if all the people that's working on the line leave their job and say they left their work, we got a problem. If the people who are working leave their job, somebody's got a problem. It says all the men who were doing the work left their work. They came to Moses and they said, look, boss, the people are bringing more than enough. More than enough. For doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. There was so much in the way of resources. The people were bringing so much that the men who were trying to do the work, can you imagine? I mean, you, you got this thing and you got your hammer and you're working. I got to get this done today. And the door opens. Hey, man, I got some more of this stuff. Where do you want me to put it? Well, put it over there. Let me get back to hammering. Hammer, hammer. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, where you? Ah, I can't get anything done. They all were experiencing this. And they all go to Moses and say, Moses, you got to do something. We can't get the work done because they're bringing all this stuff to us. All of the craftsmen, we're doing it. God's people give, God provides. Where are we going to get this gold? Where are we going to get this oil? Where are we going to get this silver? God puts it in the hands of the people. And the people bring it to God's work. Last thing. When God's people give, there is more than enough. Look at verses 6 and 7. Moses has got to do something. The people are driving the workers crazy. The workers are now driving Moses crazy. i got to do something. Moses says, stop, 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 stop. Look, everybody come together. Y'all grab a knee. That's what the coach would have said anyway. All right, whatever. <laughs> then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more. Why? Because what they already had was more than enough to do the work. Can you even imagine? you got to tell the people, look, y'all driving us nuts. You're bringing too much money to the church. We ain't got time to count all this money. we got work to do. That's what was happening. Well, what happened here? Well, what happened was God gave a vision. Uh, he, he had a vision of what He wanted to see happen. And He gave the people a vision. He gave the vision to Moses. Moses gave it to the people. God provided the people with everything they needed to have. God prompted their hearts. And when He prompted their hearts, they brought it in. When they brought it in, they gathered it together. And there was more than enough to do what needed to be done. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And that brings us back today. That brings us back to right here and right now. Last night, I sat in a room, uh, Axton Men's Hope Center Gala. There's a fundraiser for the Men's Hope Center over in Axton. And we sat there, we had a nice meal, and they auctioned off a bunch of things, and all of that was really cool. But the highlight of the evening for me, they played this video, and there's a guy and a girl, and both of them had their own stories, but the guy... His story really spoke to my heart. And he started off his story talking about how, how early in life, because of a lot of different variables, he didn't ask for it, but early in his life, he wasn't making excuses. Early in his life, he got into some things that led him into, into uh, substance abuse, led him into addiction. And he told the story about how from a young age until when he was a grown man, substance abuse and addiction just took over his entire life. Cost him everything huge hole in the middle of his heart, and then he found the Hope Center. Now, I'm not here today to preach Hope Center to you. I love Hope Center, but the reason I'm telling you this story is because that man found his way into a Hope Center. What is a Hope Center? A Hope Center is a place where, where God gave a man named Josh Hanna this vision that every Compassion Church should have a Hope Center attached to it because it's a place that meets the need in the community for people who are struggling with addiction. Josh didn't have the resources, but he, he started the process in faith that God was going to provide. And now there are Hope Centers all over the country. There are Hope Centers in Hawaii, in, in, in UK, uh, Honolulu. I mean, all over the place, man. That man said that he came to the Hope Center, and yes, he found recovery from his addiction. But he also, listen, listen, listen. He also found Jesus while he was there. And his problem wasn't drugs. His problem was when he was separated from a relationship with Christ. And when he came to that place, he found God. And Jesus saved his soul. And what I'm saying to you this morning, 
is that this is a place that's very similar. It's a very similar place. People come into this place. This week I sat across the table from a lady who had recently lost her husband. And as she talked to me about, about the pain and the sorrow, and I can't describe to you, I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to go forward. She could have gone a lot of places. But you know where she came? She came to the church. She came to a place looking for God to say, here's where you're going to find help. And I look around this room and I think about relationships and conversations that I've had with people. You know, I think about our, our students, Pastor Wes Chilton, who every week on Wednesdays, he's, he's out there on that fantastic blue van that gets about every third lick. Uh, <laughs> he's on that van and he's going and picking up kids. Why? Because he loves them. And he grew up in an environment where, where, where Jesus wasn't a big part of his family growing up and he saw the destruction. And he doesn't want any other student to have to go through that. So he goes and gets them. And he tells them about Jesus. And they come here and they, they have a relationship with, a, with a, a small group leader who cares about them. Right back now, right now behind the wall in our kids' ministry, kids are being taught about Jesus. My 11-year-old my comes home from church last weekend. I said, Naomi... What did you learn at church today? Now, if y'all know my Naomi, a.k.a. the rat, um, but my, 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 my little rat, she don't pay attention to a lot of stuff sometimes. I said, what did you learn at church today? She said, we learned about Mary and Martha. <coughs> she remembered something. Tell me about Mary and Martha. Yeah, uh, Martha was real busy while Mary was sitting down at Jesus' feet and listening. I'm like, come on, come on. Who taught that lesson? Katie did. Katie taught us about that. What is that? That's a person investing. And what I'm telling you today is, I can tell you story after story about what I see happening right now with our sidewalk Sunday school and with our, our nursing home ministry and with our, 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 our groups that meet. But what I really want you to do is lift up your eyes. And I want you to see North Point. And I want you to see Church of the Highlands. And I want you to see the LA Dream Center. And I want you to know that they started right where we're starting. Amen. And they started in a place where some people had a vision yes. that, that, that I've got more than enough in my life. I've got lights on and I've got heat and I've got, I've got all kinds of comfort. <laughs> and I'm willing to sacrifice because I see the hearts of people who are hurting. And they were willing to go into that and some people could give $5 and some people could give $5 million. And it doesn't matter what the person gives, how did they get there? They got there when the collective group had a collective heart, number one for God, and then number two, God's vision and plan and heart for people. Where does that bring us? Well, it brings us to here. And today, you have an awesome opportunity. What I'm telling you is you have an awesome opportunity because today we're not talking about building a building. We're not talking about renovating an old building that, that's been sitting there for a long time that needs a lot of repair. We're talking about building a hospital for the sick in Danville. We're talking about a spiritual hospital. They know where to go when their arms bleed. They know where to do, go when they've, got, when they've got a hemorrhage and cancer. But what do you do when your soul is broken? Where do you go when, a, when everywhere else that I go wants from me, from me, from me, and they don't provide answers that change things. Why don't you go to a place where people would line up and tell you, I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I once was blind, but now I see. We're building a hospital. And that hospital is called Compassion Church in Danville, Virginia. Now, glory be to God, for it is by his mighty power and work within us that He is able to accomplish infinitely more than you would ever dare ask or hope or imagine. That's Ephesians 3.20. And this morning is going to be one of those watershed mornings where as a church we say, God, I hear you. God, I hear you. I've been telling you about this for weeks. And so right now, this is our opportunity. Here's what we're going to do. You notice we didn't take up an offering earlier in the service like we normally do. We're going we're gonna to receive one offering this morning. But man, is this special. Now, now listen. Just listen. I'm going to give you some instructions right now. If you came prepared to give your offering, um, we're going to do it all at one time. And so we're going to take up our regular, normal offering. And that takes care of all of our expenses and bills and keeps the lights on and all of that stuff. But we're also taking up the special offering. 
As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter to me if you designate where your giving goes. Like, like if you want it specifically go, to go to the building fund, you can write that on your, on your giving. And, and we have to use it for that if you designate it that way. If you don't care how we use it, in other words, if you don't care if we spend the money that you turn in to be spent on staff or on, on ministry or on, on paying the bills or whatever, that gives us a lot of flexibility. But I understand some people want to give specifically to something that they can see. However you do that doesn't matter to me. We're going to use it and we're going to use it to grow God's kingdom. Now here's what I'm saying to you. In just a moment, our band's going to come out and they're going to sing a song. And while they're singing, I'm going to ask you, if you're giving in this offering, there's two buckets up here. And I'm going to ask you, now listen to what I'm telling you. I don't want you to just come and drop it off. I'd love to see families bring your offering. Put it in that offering. Take a moment, find a spot somewhere up here where you can just stop and pray. Husband, wife, family, individuals, however you do that. Um, if you want to give online, a lot of you may be saying, well, I didn't know about this, but I want, I want to contribute. So how do I do that? Well, the easiest way is, is the text to give. The instructions are up here. Uh, it says text CC Danville to 7797. What that simply means is if you were going to send me a text, you would type in my name or put in my number. Where you would do that, put in 77977. And then where you would say, hey, Jeff, where are we eating Mexican food? We're working on some chips today. But, uh, where you would put that, type in CC Danville, and it's going to talk you through exactly what to do. If you do that, if you give online this morning, do me a favor. If you give online this morning, do me a favor. Whatever you're going to give online, would you just write it down on a piece of paper? You don't even have to put your name on it. But I want you to be able to participate in this too. If you write it down on a piece of paper, uh, bring it and, and put, it, put it in these baskets. Take time to pray. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing, and I'm just going to ask you, when you bring your offering forward, drop it off. Take time to pray. Take as long as you like. They're going to sing a song. You guys pray together. And then when that's finished, I'm going to come back up and pray over it. And then we'll go to our closing from there. All right. You ready? Here we go.